but this idea wants to stay attached, wants us to stay attached to it. And just about every time when we get down to, even if it doesn't like what it's doing, it saw that it helped make sense of things, something for it becomes self-aware when you hold your attention with it long enough, generally kind of like in a dialogue or conversation questioning it. It's afraid that you will let go of it because it's afraid that it will die. Even if it's a belief, it doesn't want to be there anymore. It's suffering. Get me out of here, this. And I'm not even, and I'm still hurting the, the host that I'm there to try and help. But don't let me go because I don't want to die. And so whatever protective function it allowed uh, or provided for a while, at a certain point, it also has its own survival, fear, driving to push us to believe it, believe we're a piece of shit, believe we're stupid, believe things won't work. Uh, it, it, it wants us to stay in fear, not for our benefit, but for its own survival. And so, yes, it could have provided some protective strategy, some relief, some explanation, some understanding. And it is also a living being uh, with its own agenda at our cost and our suffering. Observations, requests, Mr. Sean and Daniel. Sean first. Yeah, I have a question in this. I know it's maybe a difficult question, and I. Um, I don't expect like this could be a whole, probably a whole class and I don't want it to be that, but I'm just wondering your, your working definition of what the ego is these days. Cause I'm kind of not lost, but, uh, I'm struggling to define what it is and I know it's tricky to define, but I'm just wondering, so what your, what would be your definition of it? Okay, my definition of the ego. Did you did you uh, see the energy chain three on the ego mind energy? Uh, I just started to watch some of it, but yeah. After we get through the, I kind of do a setup, and then after we get through kind of the meditation, where I'm like, okay, go watch this thing, and kind of the particular aspect of it to watch in that meditation is where does it try to take you. What kind of thoughts does it try to take you in? What kinds of uh, emotions? What kind of actions? Just to watch its tendency to pull you into temptation and distraction and activities. Okay, and so after watching it, then at about an hour mark, I go into a whole kind of presentation of like, here's where it is. Here's what it looks like. Here's how it behaves. Here's how you feel it in your body. Here's the kind of stories it tells. I've been, you know, doing this work a while and I'm, you know, working on some habits and some mental habits, but I'm, you know, just along the way, I'm like, oh, what is it I'm fighting? What is it I'm, what is it I'm working with? So just, maybe yeah. I'm just chasing my tail a bit, but. <clears throat> no, no, it's, it's an excellent question. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll share the. I'll, I'll share the big picture answer without pulling punches. Probably the matrix is the best uh, movie representation that you'll see. Uh, we as a being have many energetic fields. You know, there's just, we talk about body, mind, spirit. Well, physical body, we actually have an emotional body, a soul, a dreaming body. We call we should just call that consciousness, which can move out of body. Okay. And the soul part of that is basically a, a, a spherical, most like egg shape from about this big down to your feet that arounds you. In that energetic field, it's kind of filaments of light, as you can think of it as an energetic field of light. It's basically like a cell membrane. Okay. The ego is what Miguel would call the parasite, or Eckhart Tolle would call the pain body. To me, exists as 
a, a layer of fog, a cloudy mass around the skin of the body. We talk about somebody having a dark cloud around them. Uh, that dark cloud exists as kind of this fog-like, dark-like, grayish, uh, cloudy fog material. It's, it's mostly emotional, largely emotional, because you feel it while well, you feel it emotionally. But it's, it's a dream of stories, emotions, and it has our personal energy in it. Uh, it's kind of attached to us, and why the description of pain body or parasite. And it's feeding us its stories. It's our, our mind is able to hear what it says, or perceive what it says, our physical body, emotional body is able to perceive the feelings and impulses it gives us. And even we can feel the impulses it gives us physically. Uh, and kind of pulling our strings, whether it's a physical impulse or a nervous system or emotional or a story, it's, it's offering those, allowing us to feel those to kind of pull our attention into some activity of thought or uh, emotion or fear or story that we'll believe. Okay. So from a, I, I kind of, for me, it makes a lot of sense to kind of look at it from a, almost a biological or evolutional standpoint. Like, is there, the What's its intent? Is the intent to uh, like a, as a protection and to keep you safe? Is that is that really what it is? Um, when you get to the core of it, this it is. Just, the, I mean, it's taken to extremes, obviously, but right. Okay, so uh, there is what it's created out of what it believes its intent is, and then it's what its actual intent is. So that has different answers depending on what, what we're asking. Um, is its own living being that we gave birth to, we created, or that we gave host to when somebody gave it to us. Okay. If somebody, you know, teacher told somebody in the playground or a bully said, Gary, you're a stupid piece of shit. There's a story. It's, it's this energetic dream. Let's say stories, dreams with emotions, ideas are alive, right? If I accept that, I agree. And this is very clear when Miguel wrote the four agreements. He's like, these are the agreements with you make, right? Those agreements become alive. They look like ideas. If I agree with the idea, I am that. Now that idea is alive in me and around me. As a parasitic emotional thought. Now, if I don't agree, I go, well, you're stupid. <laughs> don't believe that. I don't accept it in. I don't agree to support that story. Energetic thought. It's not alive with me, right? Now, if somebody treats me poorly and I'm like, you know, why are they doing that? They must do that because I'm a stupid piece of shit and I deserve it. I make up my own story about something that happened to me. Same one as somebody gave me, but it's based on what they, the way they treated me. Okay, I agree. I make this belief. So now I have some rational sense. Oh, this is why they're treating me this way. Now I have this idea alive in me, and it is also part of that fog around me. What, now, why did I make up that story? 
because I was confused. It's like, here's something happening to me that doesn't make sense. They're treating me really poorly. Confusion is attention. Let me make up an explanation. Oh, why, the, why is this happening to me? Oh, I must deserve it. Why do I deserve it? Oh, because there's something wrong with me. I'm stupid. I, I, I did a stupid thing. I'm a stupid person, right? I'm a bad person. That's why people, bad people get treated poorly. They get punished, right? Okay, so now I have an explanation. In, in the rationalization of trying to figure out what's going on with me and this person and this dynamic, you know, I now have an answer. Well, that feels better than confusion. Oh, so that part of my mind has some relief. Now the unintended consequences, it's like now I have this dream alive instead of I'm a stupid piece of shit and I deserve to be treated that way. Right? And now after that interaction has gone, I'm still carrying around this dreaming mind telling me this story, holding this identity of myself in my mind, my ego mind. And it's alive and it wants food. And it's like, hey, Gary, remember this. You deserve this. And this is why, right? So it comes and it's like, feel that way again. Believe that about yourself again. And so now I've taken something that gave me a little bit of relief from confusion momentarily, but now it's an ongoing narrative story idea of myself that's regularly reinforcing itself. And if it happens multiple times, then it's reinforced on the outside. Okay. And so in that case, it has nothing to do with protecting me or helping me, but it's also, but it is alleviating me some from this confusion, trying to make sense of my experience in the world. Okay. But now it's become something else. It no longer serves that purpose and kind of keeps me trapped in a narrative and the feeling and a false state of identity. And then uh, now when we go to get rid of it, and we say, well, here I found this belief. It comes from this moment. You know, that wasn't true at all. It turns out they were the jerk. <laughs> or they were drunk or they were, uh, that was all a lie. Because you just see it as a story. You see this, like, this is a thing my mind has. It's not me. And now, but this idea wants to stay attached, wants us to stay attached to it. And just about every time when we get down to, even if it doesn't like what it's doing, it saw that it helped make sense of things, something for it becomes self-aware. When you hold your attention with it long enough, generally kind of like in a dialogue or conversation questioning it, it's afraid that you will let go of it because it's afraid that it will die. Even if it's a belief, it doesn't want to be there anymore. It's suffering. Get me out of here, this. And I'm not, not even, and I'm still hurting the, the host that I was there to try and help. But don't let me go because I don't want to die. And so whatever protective function it allowed uh, or provided for a while, at a certain point, it also has its own survival, fear, driving to push us to believe it, believe we're a piece of shit, believe we're stupid, believe things won't work. Uh, it, it, it wants us to stay in fear, not for our benefit, but for its own survival. And so Yes, it could have provided some protective strategy, some relief, some explanation, some understanding. And it is also a living being uh, with its own agenda at our cost and our suffering.
too long an answer? Or... No, I, I question. Think it's, good. It, it's tricky to define, I think. But... Yeah, yeah, right. it's it's there with multiple purposes depending on which point of view and which time. And I think we're talking, we're dealing with the more of the unconscious ego, right? Where it's it's just a set of things that are running that. And that's what we're trying to eliminate. Yeah, like if you, that, if you that we've all grown, or yeah, if you take if they they generally have some kind of productive or some protective narrative that they operate from uh, or did at one time. The the judge is almost always got some version of well, I'm trying to keep you in your place. You don't get attention because if you get attention, they'll make fun of you and you'll get shame because find out, oh, that happened when you were eight years old. Uh, I'm trying to push you to punish you because if you feel really bad about yourself, you'll hate that and you'll hate yourself and you'll be motivated to try harder and do better. You know, and if you do better, then you'll get accepted and you'll be liked and then your life will be better. But I mean, it, it, it does it so much we become debilitated or depressed and it, it's not able to really measure, well, gosh, this isn't really working and there are other ways to do it. Let's do something different. So those are the kind of protective narratives that they continue to push hard under that are false. The victim, oh, if I feel really bad about myself and I'm, I'm ashamed and quiet, then people will leave me alone. And you see like depression is I'm just going to stay in my room. Nobody bothers me. Nobody cares about me. We don't try anything. Therefore, we can't fail. And we won't get criticized. So you see these kind of characters have some protective, some story that they are protecting us from some hurt, usually emotional, uh, as, as part of their origin okay yeah thanks for the refresher it was good yeah but it was it was it was multiple times with miguel on journeys i i could see the fog around people it wasn't, it wasn't a metaphorical explanation Miguel gives about a parasite. Uh, you know, the, the, the visual bandwidth of or wavelength of what we see is very small compared to the wavelengths that are out there. You know, we don't see infrared or ultraviolet, for example. And there's other bandwidths of energy we don't see, but uh, I've, I've had experiences of seeing other bandwidths and, you know, I was sober and not on anything and it happened multiple times. And of course, at the time I'm like, am I really seeing this? What, the, what is going on? Am I, maybe I'm just making it up. And so I had a whole lot of skepticism that I was seeing what I thought I was seeing. And, but then I'd ask the person next to me, what do you see? And they describe it. And they describe exactly what I saw. So the other times, what did you see? And they describe it. I'm like, okay, that's what I saw. And I began to trust, like, okay, that's really there. It's not me making something up, even though it was sober. Uh, and so we have enough experiences like that. You go, okay, that's that's a thing. That's how it works. And so the the Matrix movie that I mentioned is, I think, is a good reference because when you're in it, you know, you don't realize that you're you're in this bubble. <laughs> Stories are being fed to you. You're living a story-driven life in your mind. Your inner world seems real. Everything you believe seems real. It's really the way the world is. What you believe about yourself is this. What you believe about the world is that. And... Uh, it's very convincing and uh, none of it's true. And then to so have this realization, you're like, wake up and you see your pod and you see like, oh my God, that was just this big dream or this whole collection of many dreams, stories and emotions I was having 
in my pod, break out of your own cloud. And then the that's one kind of level of awakening, conscious awakening, the outside your mind. And then there's a second one when you like wake up and you go, oh, everybody else is still in their pod. Right. Oh, crap. And as much as, as much as it felt fantastic to kind of break free of this cloud I was in, and I could breathe and I felt like freedom and I had no fear and I was like, oh my gosh. Over time, then I began to look around and I'm, I'm like, well, wait a minute, everybody else, you know, it, did, it didn't clue me in this other thing, had much later realization. Oh, everybody else is still in a pod. They're still just in their ongoing stories. And that, and that was emotionally painful. That was, it was heartbreaking, shocking and heartbreaking, painful to, to have that realization awakening. And, um, And so it goes.